The following podcast is a presentation of Project Entertainment Network. Welcome to the Sample Chapter Podcast, the show where authors read a sample chapter from one of their books. Here's your host, Jason A. Meiske. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 176 of the Sample Chapter Podcast. Oh man, we've got a great show for you today. Uh, first, before I forget, let me just wish a uh, a post Happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers out there around the world. Anyone listening to this, if you are a mother, I hope you had a wonderful day over the weekend. I hope your family took care of you. I did my best to take care of my wife and my own mother. Uh, for the most part, we just had a relaxing day. But I made sure that my wife did absolutely no cooking, no cleaning, no nothing. I took care of everything for her and then had a nice long conversation with my mom on the phone. So that was good. So anyway, all was good and uh, we had a really nice time. And uh, once again, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. (laughs) I feel like I feel like I'm back in the 80s again. (laughs) Saying things, saying, talking like that. It's like to all the mothers. Yeah. I should just start beatboxing here in a minute. No, I, I was no good at that then either. Hey, how about we talk about today's guest? <laughs> Michael Carter is our guest today, and he is here with one of the most unique titles and story ideas I have heard on this show yet. Picture, if you will, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, plus The Da Vinci Code, mixed with Planet of the Apes. Put all that together, and you have In the Belly of the Bell-Shaped Curve. Michael's debut novel came out in October of 2020, so a few months ago. Uh, Well, gosh, what is this? This is May? So, you know, half a a year ago. But still, uh, the book came out. It's doing really well, and uh, he's here to talk to us today about this book and so much more. It's a great conversation. Uh, We're talking about his past experience as a lawyer and how some of those experiences he was able to bring into his writing, um, how for a long time he wrote secretly, didn't tell people that he was writing a fiction story. Uh, you know, we discuss uh, conceiving of the perfect crime to write in the novel, <laughs> which is really interesting, hearing, uh, hearing some of that. And, of course, uh, he also touches on the benefits of writing every day, something I completely agree with and completely am failing at here lately. But, thankfully, Michael is doing well with it, and uh, we're going to have a good conversation about him and his book. So stay tuned for that. It's coming up here in just a few moments. You don't want to miss out on that. Oh, not to mention, as the show title says, a great sample chapter from the book. So all that's coming up here in just a few moments. I'm just going to set that aside. I've got uh, just a few other things to go over real quick uh, because, you know, of course, because, of course, we want to make sure we are thanking our sponsors and podcast friends. Oh, got to move this out of the way. I've got my candy sitting here. I I finished off some of my candy. Maybe you can hear it. That's my little Christmas jar. It's a plastic jar, but it looks like Santa's belly. And uh, at Christmas time, that was full of hard candy. Uh, as my grandparents used to say, it was their suck candy. And I know to a lot of you out there, that's probably, it probably sounds gross, but it's, it takes me back to my childhood, you know, the little ribbon candy or the other flavored ones. And I don't know, my, my wife gets me a jar of it every year and I put it in this candy jar and I finally finished it off here a while back. Uh, now I've filled it up with bottle caps. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's great for the teeth, right? <laughs> anyway, but uh, yeah, that's what that sound was. So let me push my jar aside. <clears throat> uh, yeah, anyway, back to our sponsors and friends of the show, starting with, you know, let's do this differently. Let's do this differently. Stuff. Let's talk about our podcast friends. Yeah, always I always talk about our sponsors first, and maybe I should. But <laughs> we're going to talk about our podcast friends, uh, starting with Pop Goes the Culture Network. Home to, uh, you know, 10 or 12 different shows, uh, wonderful pop culture related shows. Every one of them all has something to do with pop culture. 
whether that is the flagship show Pop Goes to Culture podcast or Fellowship of the Geeks, the Two Deads review, Multiverse Tonight, and one of my favorites, to be perfectly honest, The Backlot by Alamo Drafthouse. That just came back on the air. They've got a couple of episodes back up again, and I've been very excited to listen to them talk about having the theater open again and uh, you know what's coming out each week. Great shows, great entertainment, and if you enjoy pop culture, make sure you are hopping over there and checking out all the different shows and articles that there are available. Just click that link in the show notes for more. I also want to thank Project Entertainment Network, home to about 35 different shows of a wide variety. Whether you're interested in you know shows about baseball or writing or maybe uh, storytelling, there's also book reviews, comedy debate shows. There's the horror shows like uh, Necrocasticon, the Armcast Dead Sexy podcast, and uh, of course another one of my favorites, the Mondo Method podcast. So many great shows on there. Go to their website and find more just like this 30 second commercial. A podcast where three horror authors discuss monsters? It must be Wondering Monster Roll Initiative! I feel like once you put the mask on it... It's, once you put the mask on it, it's a monster. Please rise for his yeah, dishonor. Nope, the, Judge of the abyss. The fed his pig at the table of suffering. You brought... You brought, you brought the Whomping Willow. I brought a goddamn kaiju. <laughs> we'll see you every Monday. Alright, thank you once again to both of my podcast networks. I'm so happy to be a part of it. Oh, my goodness. Man, I don't know if you could hear that or not. My back just popped. I stood up straighter in the, uh, or sat up straighter in my chair, and back went pop. <laughs> I don't know if that came through or not. I'll have to find out in post. Anyway, yes, thank you so much to the podcast networks. Uh, click that link in the show notes so you can find out more. I'm having all kinds of fun today, aren't I? I also want to thank our uh, first sponsor, Scrivener. They've been a part of the show for, oh my gosh, like two years now. They are my favorite writing software, and now Scrivener 3 is available with so many new features and wonderful attributes uh, to check out. you got to get over there and uh, and see everything that Scrivener 3 has to offer. Like I said, my writing has not done that good lately. I was doing really good last week, but then, you know, Mother's Day, so on, you know, that was coming up. I had a lot of things to prepare, had a lot of work to do at the end of the week, so my writing kind of suffered. But suffice to say, I plan to get back on it uh, maybe today, maybe tomorrow. We'll see. Maybe Tuesday when this episode comes out on the 11th. Uh, maybe that's when I'll get to uh, focus some more on it again. But I do it all through Scrivener, as you know. And you know what? I'm going to just shut up. <laughs> Let's get over to our commercial. And you can find out how to save 20% on the regular desktop version. Jason here. Hey, I wanted to take a moment and tell you about my favorite writing tool, Scrivener. Now, I know you've heard about Scrivener because their writing software has been embraced by hundreds of thousands of other writers like you and I, from the novice to best-selling novelists. The reason we all use it is because of Scrivener's core concept to bring all the writing tools you use together in a single application. And with tools like automatic backup, character maps, project goals, and let's not forget that amazing corkboard, you can see why I use Scrivener every day. As a bonus for Sample Chapter Podcast listeners, use code CHAPTER for 20% off your desktop version. Scrivener writing software, built by writers for writers. Thank you, thank you, thank you once again to Scrivener. I love their service. I love writing in there, and I love everything they have to offer. Uh, speaking of offers, I want to thank our, uh, uh, not a sponsor per se, but a partner with the show now, and that is Audible. We've uh, partnered up with Audible to give you a free audiobook and free 30-day trial. So you can click that link in the show notes and uh, and grab some of those. It's I do a lot of uh, reading through Audible, which, yes, that counts. <laughs> So one of the things I like to do is I grab the big books, the classics. Uh, is one of the things I, I really enjoy doing is you get a big, thick, thousand-page book, you know, and 
you listen to it on Audible. That way you can say, yes, I read War and Peace. I have not yet, but I could say that because of Audible. So <laughs> that's just, it's just an example. Hey, check out this little bitty and uh, to hear more about the offer. <laughs> Hello, friends. Jason here. And I wanted to take a moment to tell you about a great offer from Audible. Like you, I'm very busy. I have a full-time job, a family, I'm a thriller author, and I do this weekly podcast. But I also love to read. That's where Audible is a lifesaver for me. Whether I'm mowing the yard, working out, driving back and forth to work, or doing some other menial task, I can still listen to an incredible book through Audible. And now you can get a free 30-day trial by going to audibletrial.com slash sample chapter. By doing that, you'll not only have that 30-day trial, you'll also gain access to guided wellness programs, theatrical performances, A-list comedy, exclusive Audible originals, and even podcasts like the Sample Chapter Podcast. Last year is the first time I ever achieved my own personal reading goals, and it was because of some wonderful titles I listened to on Audible. Some of those titles were Ready Player Two by Ernest Cline, narrated by Will Wheaton, the Awaken Online series from Travis Bagwell, narrated by David Stifle. Patient Zero by Jonathan Mayberry, narrated by the incredible Ray Porter. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention previous guest Scott Meyer with his Magic 2.0 series, narrated by Luke Daniels. It's a lot of fun and definitely worth your time. A hey, full disclosure, by signing up at audibletrial.com slash sample chapter, the show does get a little monetization, which goes directly towards any production needs uh, with the show. So you're also helping us out here by signing up. So what are you waiting for? Head on over now to audibletrial.com slash sample chapter and start your free 30-day trial today. All right, so there we are. That's all of our podcast friends and sponsors. Uh, as I said, click that link in the show notes so you can find out more. But in the meantime, for now, let's go ahead and get over to our interview with today's guest, Michael Carter. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to the Sample Chapter Podcast. This week, we are diving into a very exciting book that I cannot wait to hear more about. And I know you're going to be interested in hearing more about this as well. Our guest is Michael Carter. Michael graduated from Indiana University with a bachelor's in English and from McKinney School of Law with a doctorate of jurisprudence. And I think I said that correctly. Yes, you he, did. <laughs> he practiced law for several years as a trial lawyer, later worked in state government as a deputy attorney general and as a chief counsel for the state agency and provided support to poor to the poor and those in need. Now he's here discussing In the Belly of the Bell-Shaped Curve, his debut novel. What a title. Michael Carter, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. It's great to be here. I'm so happy to have you here. I cannot wait to, you know, to dive into this book and hear more about it. But first, uh, give us a little more about, you, about your background. Well, as you pointed out, I uh, went to law school here in, uh, Indian well, I live in Indianapolis. That's where I went to law school at the McKinney School of Law, practiced law for a lot of years. For about 25 years, I was a trial lawyer. Um, I mostly practiced in the area of um, medical malpractice defense. So I was representing a lot of hospitals, a lot of nurses, a lot of doctors when they were sued for medical malpractice. I uh, did a lot of other types of litigation as well. And then um, then I went uh, after about 25, 30 years, I decided I would go into work for the state uh, to do some public service. And at that point, I, I started uh, what's called the section chief for the administrative and regulatory litigation section. Say that three times fast. <laughs> and that was very interesting. I had a lot of class action lawsuits against the state. And then... Um, so it was totally different than what I'd done before, um, but it was these class action lawsuits are just huge. And uh, from there, I went on to the um, state agency in Indiana that that uh, deals with issues for um, the poor, the elderly, the disabled. Is the Family and Social Services Administration. So I went to work for them as their chief counsel, 
and have been working for FSSA. That's the that's the initials for it, FSSA, since that time. Well, now, and something that uh, a lot of people may not realize is just how much writing lawyers will uh, will have to do. And is that where your love for uh, writing has come into? Yes, well, I actually uh, came before that. But what I didn't realize um, when I was majoring in English was I thought maybe if I was going to law school, I should probably major in political science or something. But as it turned out, English was a was a great major because there is so much writing in the practice of law. It's not the fun kind of writing that you do uh, creatively, but there is a lot of trying to make persuasive arguments, trying to be concise and, you know, trying to put words together. Um, so a lot of that is, is really helpful. And then, of course, the practice of law, I think, is helpful in experiencing a lot of different things that you can, you can bring to your writing. Oh, that's true. That's true. I hadn't even thought about that. <clears throat> I'm sure. That yeah, you if get, you ever uh, handle a divorce uh, case, you'll know exactly <laughs> what that's <laughs> like. That's my least favorite area of law. I only had to do you know a few of them for a while, but um, that was the worst. Oh my gosh, I bet so. I bet so. Yeah, my my wife is a speech language pathologist, and she had changed her major twice while in school before finally settling on this. And she hates writing. She hates having to write, but yet she's got tons of paperwork daily notes to write up and during school I would have to help her out with some of her papers and uh, you know obviously I write a lot different with a as a fiction writer and I just help her kind of get started and give her some direction and get her going and then you know in my mind I'm thinking yeah so here's this medical thing and then that happened but then they discovered it was another virus inside that was undiscovered and my wife's going like, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. These are facts. I have to stick to the facts. And I'm like, ah, <laughs> oh, okay, okay, you're right, you're right. So it was kind of funny. I'm trying to stretch her to, to be able to write, and she's trying to hold me back a little bit. <laughs> well, what I discovered representing uh, so many doctors was a lot of them are brilliant, but they really don't write very well. So they're, <laughs> you know, they have to do their reports, and they're like, say for instance say, you know an operative note or something but they um, I mean some of them do but a lot of them they they just think differently and then they're although they're brilliant in, in their own way they're, they're not necessarily don't necessarily look at things in, in the way that a writer or a lawyer would yeah yeah that's true so now you said you had discovered your love for writing, taking that English class. Did you have any stories that you wrote at that time or kind of dabble in some of it? Yes, I did. I took, um, actually, I, so I took English literature, but I took um, actually three, um, uh, three creative writing courses. Uh, so that would be the sophomore, junior, and senior levels writing courses in college. And so I did a lot of short story writing at that point. Oh, okay. So I had enough, I'd written, enough, I, I don't know how many short stories I've written, probably dozen, at least a dozen or more. And then I, uh, I also wrote another uh, novel in the late nineties that I never um, went on to get published. So this is my <laughs> second novel, my, my first published novel. Okay. Okay. I have a few, I, I've got some short stories from, from my high school days in the eighties and the first maybe third of a story in the 90s, maybe I think two of them that, yeah, I don't think they're ever going to come out of the drawer. I, <laughs> they may just stay there for, um, I, I don't know, maybe to reference one of these days or something, but I don't think I'm ever bringing them out. Well, I know it's funny since I, so when I was writing this book, I, I didn't tell anybody I was doing it because I didn't want to jinx myself or whatever. So I just thought, well, I'll tell people when it's done. So I didn't even tell anybody until I actually got it, knew that it was going to be published. And then I started telling people like, you know, my hairdresser or whatever. And I couldn't believe the number of people who said, oh, I've got a novel that, you know, I've written like a half of it, or I've, I've got this book idea. I just a lot of people out there who think about writing novels uh, or have a book in them. Um, and it was just interesting how many people uh, think in that way. Mm hmm. Yeah, lots of people who think about stories or think about writing, but don't follow through. And it's, it's funny, because as an author, 
once especially once we have a book it's like oh my gosh everybody's an author there's so many but there's really not that many there's to have gone through the whole process and finished the book and then to have it published whether you do it self-published or or find a home for it in a house somewhere it's quite the accomplishment there's not that many people who take it to that step so i mean it's something that you definitely stand out for and it's it's you're right it's fascinating how many people will after the fact come back with like oh you know i always thought about this and and uh, it's funny how many people will say oh you ought to write this story and uh, they tell you the story and it's like oh you know you should write it and <laughs> <laughs> i i've got i've got a drawer full of ideas and more all the time but you ought to write it and i'll uh, i'll read it for you <laughs> oh my gosh well, so now you've got your debut, came out in October, in the belly of the <clears throat> bell-shaped curve. Give us your elevator pitch. What, do, what is this about? So it's basically okay. about a number of things. Um, there are a lot of different levels to it, but it starts out it's basically about boredom, fear of mediocrity, frustration, ambition, madness, and revelation. Mm. Uh, my son read it and he, he summarizes as follows. He said, and my son is like in his early thirties. He said, it's about, it's like a combination of fear and loathing in Las Vegas, the Da Vinci code and planet of the apes. <laughs> uh, that's probably about as good a summary as I could give it. But the, um, the lead character is a frustrated claims adjuster. So, um, and in, and in that job, he has, you know, a lot of, reports and things to do but he's he's frustrated and he feels like like in our society you have I mean, you have like you have people on social media and in the on tv and in the movies and all this there's a sort of ideal out there that all of us uh feel like we're living sort of boring lives compared to these exciting beautiful people and so he's kind of experiencing that frustration so he comes up with this idea uh, to get out of his rut of his boring life to, um, for instance, if you go into like a McDonald's or just any restaurant, you know, you don't have to be able to add and subtract anymore. The machine, the, ca will the, the cash register will tell you, you know, what change to give back, a dollar yeah. and 32 cents. So just, you just have to be able to add. So his mm -hmm. idea is let's bring, I want to train these chimpanzees and bring them up just a notch so they can, operate these basic computerized you know, cash registers machines in industry or whatever and then you can hire these these chimpanzees they can do, go do the work for you and you can take care of your chimp and you can sit around and play poker or write poetry or do whatever you want to do <laughs> so that's kind of the genesis of it then it, it, it morphs um into uh, other ideas where well maybe they could even use these chimpanzees to fight wars or whatever but he comes up with the idea and then um in order to try to realize this he real, he realizes that he doesn't have the money to do it so he comes up with a scheme to embezzle money from the insurance company and uh before i went to law school i did insurance claims so i came up with a with, with an embezzlement scheme that i actually think would might work probably not i, mean, I don't i would never try it <laughs> But it, it involves creating a fictitious claimant and then you, know, you take them through all this, you know, say they had like a broken ankle, you take them through all this and you get the medical bills and then you settle the case with them. And then at the, at the last minute, the money goes not to this fictitious person, but into Turk's bank account, Turk's the lead character. So okay. he comes up with this scheme, but then once he crosses that line, uh, then, then he has to go on the black market to, to try to find these chimpanzees and he ends up connecting with some sketchy Nigerian who uh, locates the chimps and he has to you know, meet up with him to, to purchase them. He does it all on the black market. And um, so at that point, once he steps over that line, then he, his life just kind of descends into madness or at the end, possibly you know, a revelation. Hmm. <laughs> so it's pretty wild. <laughs> that definitely is wild. I, I remember reading the uh, the synopsis for it whenever I first heard about uh, you was uh, heard heard from you, and I was reading that. And I thought, oh my gosh, what a wild concept! Because uh, I mean, where do you begin? It's like 
I, I understand the boredom and, you know, the, the mind goes wild thinking of other ideas and what you could do. And, but then to start realizing that, and then you throw in the monkeys and how to do this and that, it's just, oh my gosh, this is, <laughs> this is a wild book. <laughs> yeah. It, it, the, the, the plan goes off the rails, but um, he comes to some realizations and there are some other things that, that kind of emerge and you know there there are a number of different levels to it. Um, so you know that that's the one level I described as the plot. But then you have other levels relating to well, thematic, you know, spiritual and mm. uh, mm -hmm. some some dichotomies out there: spiritual versus physical. This fine line between madness and spirituality. You know, for instance, uh, Muhammad actually. For, for the Muslim religion, he, he, that consists of him having a lot of visions that he wrote down. Hmm. And like in Revelation, so John has his vision that turns into the book of Revelation. So, that, you know, he, it's kind of exploring a little bit this idea of well, where does madness end and spirituality begin? Or, you know, some people would just say, well, they're crazy, you know. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So there are a number of levels like that. Mm hmm. And I guess the hope is the more levels you pick up on Gia through the re the richer is the experience when you read the book. That's the hope anyway. So. Yeah. Now, I mean, I can totally relate, you know, like I said, to the 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 beginning premise of that he's he's bored. He wants to try and uh, make his life a little more exciting and I, we can all relate to that. But at what point uh, did you come up with the idea of like, yeah, and um, chimpanzees i'm gonna put monkeys in here to uh to take care of this because that certainly livens up the story takes it in a different direction i wouldn't have seen coming where does that come from or where did you get that idea yeah i don't know i <laughs> i just thought of it i don't know it just came to me um just like a lot of ideas just, they just seem to i'm not sure where they come from actually <laughs> it's kind of a mystery but i kind of want to keep it that way i'm afraid if i overanalyze it um it might it might affect it <laughs> yeah yeah so so it sounds like when you were writing this this was kind of stream of consciousness that you went you weren't really uh plotting it out you just kind of like and then the monkeys uh well i actually that was one of the first ideas that i had oh it, okay it, that on which the book was premised so mm -hmm. um i had initially had 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 a general outline if you will of where it was going to go but then after i went through various drafts things kept changing and going in different directions and adding things and ultimately it sort of ended up where it would have been in the first place but um so there were some changes and some development and then in the end some uh, realizations and i don't know it's just like the writing process i it just seemed like and i don't want to I don't like to get in too much to that because I feel like I'm jinxing myself or whatever, but that whole process was um, things just start to come into and as things develop. You're looking at the at it from this character's point of view and, and it gives you kind of a different perspective on things because you're looking at it through the eyes of this, well, sort of strange character. Mm -hmm. um, so then it, it gives you certain insights and then things develop um on each other and i guess the one thing i learned is that the key is to try to write every day or at least six days a week when you're into a project even though you have to work get up every morning write for at least nine hour a day that kind of thing and then it just seems everything seems else seems to take care of itself as long as you're staying focused because there's something about the continuity of like if, if you write every day then your your short-term memory that's all in your working memory and it carries over and then mm -hmm. if you write one day and then don't write for another three weeks then you forget everything that you and you got to kind of re reinvent the wheel so to speak to get back to where you were <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely yeah it, that was something i started off this year doing pretty well and in, in writing every day doing a good job and then um <clears throat> I, I got COVID in February and I thought, Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Oh, uh, 
Well, thank you. I mean, it turned out fine. It was uh, honestly, if I'm being completely honest, when I found out I had it, uh, I didn't think it would be that bad. So I was a little bit excited about the concept of being home for two weeks. And, <laughs> and I don't have to do anything. I can I can write and uh, edit the show and, and such. I thought, oh, man, this is this is a great opportunity. And uh, instead, most of those two weeks, I was just laying there with no motivation to move at all. <laughs> and, yes, I've heard some of the stories, even people that don't get hospitalized or whatever. They right. Yeah, they are totally bottomed out. It just, uh, I mean, it never really, it didn't like, uh, I don't think it like really made me that bad or, or that sick, but I was surprised just how tired I was all the time, napping so much and being like, I don't know, I don't even want to change the channel. Like, I just don't have the energy to reach for the remote because it's just out of reach and my jet <laughs> powers were not working at that day, you know, so... <laughs> But uh, yeah, and it, it threw off my writing. It took me a couple of weeks before uh, I finally got some work caught up and some other things caught up. And then I finally was able to get back into a little bit of a daily rhythm of getting up. I get up early, same thing. And that's my writing time. And and uh, it's been been good lately. So at least uh, Monday through Friday and then about every other weekend, I'll, I'll have some time. I can uh, do some writing, but it does help. It, it's amazing how much that helps to uh, keep it in there. No, yeah, so that's something I discovered. Um, so um, next project, I'll try to do the same thing. I'm kind of between right now and more mark working on marketing now. And I, I know what my next project's going to be. I just um, I'm going to go back to my first book actually and rewrite it. But um, oh, okay. And yeah, that be. that was my next question. Was was do you write different projects at once or just focus on the one? But it sounds like you just do one at a time. Uh, yeah, pretty much one at a time. Although you know, the, that can vary. I mean, I don't necessarily write chapters in order. Um, mm -hmm. I might jump ahead to something I think is going to be about halfway or three quarters way through. And if that section's in my head, I'll write that and go back. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, and then I, I rewrite a lot. Um, so then I go back and do a second draft or a third. I did, I did several drafts of this book. And then and then I think the one great thing, my editor, iUniverse, I think they're, they have the greatest, edit, my publisher, I mean, they, they have such good editors. And I, I think it was finally to get it to the point where I could submit it to them and then have an editor review it. And that's, I, to me, that was, I'd read that's something that you always have to do. And it, it was so true for me to finally have someone else look at it from a point of view outside of myself mm. and get that feedback. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's great to have somebody that can give you honest feedback and, you know, you got to have that thick skin and be willing to uh, to take it on. But uh, if you can do that, then it's, it's fantastic to have that. Uh, the editor who checked out my first book uh, before I was done with it. Yeah, she was she was brutal, but I needed it. And she was just like, yeah, you, you're not making any sense here. Uh, this whole flashback doesn't does not go. You need to get rid of it. And different things and and it was uh i remember showing it to my wife and i'm laughing and she was like oh oh my gosh why did, how did, could she say that but uh i was like no nah, it, it's she's right you know it's like, I, and i knew she never meant any kind of uh, harm by any of it it was always uh just whatever she was thinking at the time and uh what's funny is after i was done with it i didn't send it back to her for another look over and I just published it. And then my wife read it later on. She was like, Oh gosh, no, you got to fix some things. And uh, my wife, my wife actually had harsher things to say than, uh, than the editor did. Oh. So, <laughs> but again, it was just, you know, one of those things where I, I knew she meant it out of love. She didn't want me putting out a turd. And uh, she was like, Oh my gosh, now you, this has to be fixed. And <clears throat> so some fun stuff there. Yeah, you're right. You got to have thick skin uh, and just kind of say, okay, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm just going to take it <laughs> and then try to, you know, try, try to benefit from it. Uh, you know, and, then, and what was nice about the editors at iUniverse, they, their suggestions were very constructive. So I, I didn't feel like any of them were mean spirited. They were just constructive. And when I, and I could see their point and was able to try to incorporate those. Yeah, good. 
Well, and what I what I can appreciate going back a little bit, one of the things I really appreciate is how you were talking about writing several drafts of it. You went back and you're working it over and making things work. And it's amazing, you know, the average person uh, who, of course, like we were saying before, who wants to write a book, don't realize the work that goes into it. And especially with a book, uh, well, for your yours, for example, with such wild concepts and amazing things you're trying to put together, there's a lot of work that goes into making it make sense and making the the idea, one idea work to the next one and how's that going to work. And it sounds like you you put a lot of work into it. Yes, and it, it, was, it was fun work, um, trying to make all that mesh. And, um, and I, I learned a lot just doing it. Um, mm-hmm. I'm, my next book, I think, might not be maybe a little less complex, uh, just because I guess my first one, but then I wrote it and I was looking to go back to it. There, I was putting a lot of, just a lot of different things into this book. Um, spirit things bringing them together and uh, so I I could have picked an easier project I guess I didn't but this was the one I want and the way I wanted to do it Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not sure all my books are going to be quite as complicated I guess you say as this one (laughs) we'll see what happens yeah yeah you never know you may end up uh it may be the process will just get easier and this is just you know how you do it it's like oh yeah this is a michael carter book look at these twists and and wild concepts <laughs> <laughs> people will just like no oh yeah that that's uh, his style that's what he does this is great <laughs> <laughs> well i hope <laughs> <laughs> so uh you, you said that uh, the next book is going to be you're going back to your first one can you tell us anything about that or what, what we can expect in the future Oh, well, gosh. Well, you know, I said it'd be simpler. Maybe not. So it's about, <laughs> a, <laughs> so it's about a, a, an attorney. So one of the things I did in my, one of my prior lives was, in addition to defending doctors, sometimes hospitals would, would want to kick a bad doctor off staff, and I would get hired to go in and be the one to kind of prosecute the, the case. Um, you know, you get a number of cases where the doctor committed malpractice or whatever, and then you put that together. And you'd submit it to a committee of the medical staff, which is kind of like a medical jury, if you will, and and make a, a statement that this, this person shouldn't practice medicine here because they're, they're incompetent or whatever. So, but that whole process is confidential and privileged by law. So the average public, your average John Q. public does not really know that that happens, that the, uh, there could be these bad doctors getting reviewed and kicked off staff that, and nobody knows about it. So he gets involved in one of these um, cases, and the case involves a, a malpractice in the delivering of a, in a, in a birth. It was a birth case. Um, and believe me, I had to handle some dead baby cases. They're the absolute worst. So mm-hmm. this was a baby that was uh, uh, died at birth. And the, uh, so then there's a, um, one of the nurses there who was involved in the delivery is, is like a key witness, but she has um, gone through some really tough times. A lot of it related to this case. And she's gotten into drugs and, and various things, but she is also has a, a, a cult. And this is like way out in, in, in the country and it would be like, I could think of a regional hospital down in Southeastern Indiana, which, which would be like where it would take place. So she, um, but she is uh, based on a, I won't get too involved in the library here, but it's based on a, the character is based on St. Teresa de Villa, who is a, a saint back in the 16th century and she used to have seizures. And every time she had seizures, she would wake up and have a vision. And so the characters based on her, she would have the, she had a seizure condition related to her drug abuse and everything. And she would wake up every time and have a seizure. And they had, they then did all this process where they would like, you know, would induce seizures by giving her certain substances and she'd have a seizure and we can have a vision. Well, she's the key witness. So, um, and he ends up, the leader character ends up basically kind of 
although it never, he never acts on it. He kind of falls in love with it. But anyway, she's a key witness. And then that when you go to the, the hearing, uh, things go south and well, and the, then that takes you to, the, you follow all that through to the, to the climax and the conclusion. So that's kind of a thumbnail. I haven't really thought about that book in a while. So <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you got quite the concept there and uh, plenty to work on. And that sounds like it's going to be exciting. So I can't wait to uh, hear about that when it comes out. Thank you. Well, where can uh, where can people find and follow you? Well, my website is um, michaellcarter.com. And uh, you know, the book's available on amazon.com, barnesandnoble.com. Uh, my uh, publisher's website, which is iUniverse.com slash forward slash bookstore. And then, you know, mo really I'm funneling most of my marketing through the website. Well, we'll make sure and have links for that in the show notes so that way everybody knows right where to go and they can uh, follow you and check out your website. And uh, of course, pick up the book uh, in the belly of the bell shaped curve. Sounds <laughs> like I said, it sounds incredible, uh, amazingly uh, interesting. And uh, one that I can't wait to check out for myself. Well, thank uh, you. And just as a side note, my daughter did the book cover. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, and you have a link for her website on your website for uh, some other art that she does. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Her, and and she, she has a master's in graphic arts. She lives in Switzerland. And uh, yeah, her website is pretty incredible. She's done a lot of it really neat work. She does a lot of abstract there you go well there you go everybody so you know when you're going to michael carter's website you click on there uh you can also head over to his daughter's website and who knows maybe there's some authors out there listening to this right now looking for uh, another cover designer so <laughs> oh she's great and and she does she does web she designs websites for people she does book covers she i mean she just does all kinds of stuff so. perfect yes well we'll make sure and have that in the show notes as well uh Mr. Carter, thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been a delight. And uh, yeah, like I said, I can't wait to uh, hear more about uh, some of your future stories. Well, thank you. It's been my pleasure. I've really enjoyed talking with you. A pleasure has been all mine. Ladies and gentlemen, you know what that means. Time for me to step aside <laughs> with my drink and a cigar. And we're going to all enjoy this sample chapter from my guest, Michael Carter with In the Belly of the Bell-Shaped Curve. Thank you. Two days later, he was approaching the appointed place at the appointed time. He had been driving for hours. It had been interstate most of the way. It took him to the edge of this godforsaken industrial wasteland located on the southern shore of one of the Great Lakes. The exit ramp had deposited him at the outskirts of this forbidden zone. According to Abdullah's directions, Turk was to continue directly north. His ultimate destination was an isolated dock where he would take delivery of his revolutionary cargo and begin the final phase of the fulfillment of his destiny. He was driving a large rental van with a cargo box in the back like the ones he had rented when he was in college and was moving his possessions from his dorm room to his home or an apartment off campus. It was a mild night for mid-January. It had rained and the air was moist. Fog rose off the pavement. Even though the air in the cab had been cycled through the heater, it still smelled foul and unnatural. He had kept driving. In the distance were chemical and manufacturing plants, huge smokestacks, elaborate arrays of pipe-like fixtures and massive storage tanks. Just like the neighborhood where he was born, he felt the entire place could explode at any moment. This was no place for candles, but on top of one of the factories was a perpetual bluish flame. A number of small cities had grown up throughout this area, wedged between the giant factories. Each was a separate municipality. The entire atmosphere of the place had to be unhealthy. There were probably pockets of mutants spread around the region. A lot of shit had gone down here. A lot of people had made a lot of money rearranging the basic elements of life to create products that generated huge profits. And he had to admit they had either found or created a need and then fulfilled that need. Was this the inevitable 
the result of his core belief when taken to its logical conclusion. He drove past a vast pit that appeared to be filled with industrial sludge. Steam was rising from the muck. It appeared that something could be brewing in the depths of that giant hole, that something was forming, something terrifying and deformed, maybe some new life form, a precursor of the beast that would come near the end of time. He could state that he had been here and stared deep into the bowels of recreation, the modern synthetic equivalent to the primordial bog from which life first arose. He was driving through a dimension where industry and manufacturing were transforming the physical universe in a way that was profit-driven, soulless, and godless. He pulled the truck over to the right edge of the road. His job was not to make judgments, but to bear witness. He had his hammer and chisel with him, as he always did. Between the side of the road and the edge of the pit was a sign that read, hauling of radioactive materials by special permit only. It was mounted in a large base of cement. Turk had become proficient at this task. It only took a few minutes. It would last. He etched it in clean and deep. Turk. He finally arrived at a long, narrow pier. This was where he was to meet Abdullah and take possession of the noble primates. His instructions said he was to turn off his headlights as soon as he reached the entrance to the pier. He complied but this made it even more difficult to see the darkness ahead. Near the end of the pier, a neon sign stood out high in the night. It simply read, gas. He parked the truck and got out. In contrast to the artificial light, the darkness beyond seemed endless and unfathomable, as if there was no light out there. He suddenly became afraid. He looked back at the bright sign as he stared directly into the artificial light, he thought he could feel the pupils of his eyes contract into microscopic peepholes. He feared that his eye muscles might get stuck and he could be blinded. He stared back into the darkness. He thought he could feel his pupils dilate to the point that they consumed the entire irises in both eyes. He feared the force of gravity and the deep darkness beyond could rip his soul and his conscious being right out of his body and into the vast infinite blackness. Like a celestial body suspended in space, being drawn ever faster with no possibility of escape, even faster than the speed of light into a collapsing star. He realized that he had to get a grip on his emotions. He was at a crossroads now. This was no time to panic. He walked past the neon sign deeper into the night and shined his flashlight outward. He could see no stars overhead. He thought he sensed motion emerging from the darkness. He turned off the flashlight so that he would not stand out in the total blackness that surrounded him. God, he hoped it was Abdullah and not some predator. Turk was exposed. He had no weapons. He had no way to defend himself against any criminals or gangs or wild dogs. He wasn't even sure that something was out there. Perhaps he had detected this from some combination of his smell and hearing. He couldn't see anything, but he thought he felt something. Perhaps he was receiving a signal emanating from deep inside the reptilian part of his brain, firing haphazardly through the remnants of ancient neurocircuitry that had atrophied ages ago over thousands of years of evolution. Then a huge set of white teeth glimmered directly in front of his face. He could see the whites of a pair of bloodshot eyes. It was Abdullah. Turk flipped on the flashlight and shined it directly into Abdullah's face. He wore a huge grin. Good evening, Mr. Malone. It is nice to see you again. Hello, Mr. Abdullah. I'm glad to see you, or anyone for that matter, Turk said. You will be pleased to know that the shipment has arrived as planned. Excellent, said Turk. Give me the money and wait here, said Abdullah. These are delicate matters. It's best for you that you not meet these men face to face. You should keep as much distance as you can. Turk walked back to the truck and opened the passenger door to the cab. He opened the glove compartment and took out a plastic bag containing the $70,000 in cash. He walked back to Abdullah. 
Turn the truck around and back it up to the entrance to the pier, just past the neon sign, said Abdullah, and wait for me. I'll be back soon. There was no way Turk would give him the money and watch him disappear into the darkness, trusting that he would return with the chimps. Sorry, Mr. Abdullah, he said. Don't be offended, but I will not turn over the $70,000 until I have my chimps. I understand, said Abdullah. We have not spent enough time for you to have built your trust in me. You keep the money for now. Go ahead and turn your truck around and back it up. Watch me in the rearview mirrors and I will guide you to the edge of the pier. Turk rolled down the driver's side window as he had been instructed. Abdullah guided him to the edge of the pier and then held up his hands for Turk to stop. Turk could hear Abdullah open the back door to the cargo compartment. He looked in the mirror on the passenger side of the vehicle and saw Abdullah walk back into the darkness. As he stared, he focused his gaze on the blackness where the night sky and the great lake came together on the horizon, where two infinities merged. He saw several shadowy figures carrying crates into the back of the van. He could feel it bounce up and down as the chimps were loaded. He knew that there was some type of ship dock back in there on the water, but it had no lights on and he could not make out any details. Abdullah appeared to his left, just outside the open window to the cab. The chimpanzees have been loaded into the back of the van, he said. Would you like to inspect them before you turn over the money and complete the transaction? Yes, absolutely, said Turk. He got out of the cab and went to the back of the van. Abdullah raised the back door. Turk pointed his flashlight inside and there were seven chimpanzees, each in a separate crate made of plywood. The boards were placed several inches apart, apparently to allow in air. He could see his chimps through those spaces. A hairy paw stuck out from one of the crates. And another was a much smaller chimp, a baby chimp. Turk felt a surge of energy swell up from deep inside his being. He was so close now. Years from now, humanoid kind would look back on this as a historic moment. Everything was falling into place as it was as it should be, and as it would be forever. All Turk had to do now was take care of his monkeys. Turk gave the plastic bag containing the $70,000 to Abdullah. I'll wait while you count the money, said Turk. As he had done before, he had wrapped the $100 bills into bundles of 10 and then wrapped them together with rubber bands. Abdullah opened the bag and looked inside. I could see seven packets, he said. There is no need for me to examine any further. I know that you are a man of your word. Go in peace, my brother, and good luck on your new endeavor. Maybe someday our paths will cross again. Now get in the cab and drive, and for your own protection, don't look back. The less you know, the less you heard, the less you saw, the better. Do not stop until you have reached your final destination, and do not exceed the speed limit. It is important for your sake and ours that you do not arouse any suspicion. You have probably heard the saying, if you're going to break the big rules, don't break the little ones. Turk, of course, having been told not to look back, did just that. The faint glow of the taillights illuminated Abdullah's form, and then he disappeared into the darkness. Turk pressed the accelerator to the floor, and the truck shot forward. He heard a rumbling sound and the truck bounced as the cargo behind him apparently shifted backward. He drove back through the labyrinth of factories and cesspools. He drove just as he had been instructed. He did not falter. He did not waver. Finally, he reached the interstate. As he cruised up the entrance ramp, he felt safer. He had reached the anonymous stream of commerce. He could easily blend in and it would deliver him to within a few miles of his house. Oh my goodness, I don't know about you, but I think Turk is up to no good. Hey, that was our guest, Michael Carter, reading a sample chapter from his debut novel, In the Belly of the Bell-Shaped Curve. The book is available right now, so click that link in the show notes for the book and more from Michael Carter's, where you can find and follow him. Uh, don't forget to also click that link in the show notes for our podcast friends and sponsors alike. And while you're in there, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out next week when we return with our next guest, Catherine Dean Mazaroff. 
and her debut novel, Summer Club. That's coming up next week, so we will talk to you then. Take care. This has been a presentation of the Project Entertainment Network.